serpents and spiders, tail of a rat. Call in the viewers, wherever they're at. Listeners from YouTube, it's time to respond. Leave us a comment from somewhere beyond. Critics and fanboys from last Halloween, awaken subscriptions with your tambourines. Creepies and crawlies, toads in a pond, here's copyright-free music from regions beyond. Witches and wizards, wherever you dwell, Give us a like, and then click the bell. Brought to you by Madame Leota. Trademark. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Zenith Warrior Princess, the cutest of ghost buns. And speaking of ghosts, today is our Halloween episode. Joining me once again is Cat McBerry. Welcome, foolish mortals, to our haunted podcast. <laughs> Quite literally in this fact, because I am in fact a ghost. <laughs> and Doug McBerry. Sorry, I'm uh, I'm trying to hitchhike my way onto the podcast. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dang hitchhiking ghosts. We didn't like you the first three times. <laughs> Well, too bad you're stuck with me. No! Well, hello and welcome, everyone. The Disney debate is back. Uh, we're not doing our normal type episodes because, of course, today is Halloween and we wanted to get our Halloween special out. Oh, yeah. So, of course, we had to go to the well of inspiration. That is the Disney Halloween stuff. There's a lot of crazy stuff out there that we'll eventually get to, you know, like H.E. Double Hockey Sticks and a few other obscure ones, Disney Channel original movies. We'll go back to Halloween Town eventually. But today, you know, we thought because the new Haunted Mansion came out, Kat was just like, hey, do you want to do the original Haunted Mansion, the 2003 Eddie Murphy's Haunted Mansion? I'm like... Sure, why not? Let's get this over with. Because we hate ourselves, that's why. <laughs> but see, like, here's the difference. I've After suffering through the live-action remakes, I did not have as many problems with this movie as some of the others. And it's like, we've gone through many different Disney eras, and we've seen different things like the westerns and the, you know... The, the crazy 60s and the, the live action remake. So we've seen Disney go through ups and downs. And this was the 2000s. This was a very weird time because the 90s were the peak renaissance period for Disney. It was Disney getting their groove back again. And they were like, oh yeah, they, every Disney movie was fire. And then... The 2000s rolled around, and we had uh, Home on the Range, <laughs> and we had the Haunted Mansion movie. Um, so before we even start talking about this, one thing that I had to remind myself is that this was actually a really highly anticipated movie for a number of reasons. Uh, Eddie Murphy actually had a career back then. And it's weird because as I did my research on Eddie Murphy, he's kind of had the same kind of Disney problem where he had a big career surge in the 80s. He did like Coming to America and a few movies like that. And then apparently he like the late 80s, he had problems, but then he came back in the 90s with kids films. So when we were around, we just knew him as, oh, my God, it's Mushu, it's Donkey, it's the, the nutty professor. So... He was everywhere. I mean, he was legit everywhere. And it was a no-brainer that Disney would bring him back because, I mean, they already did did a great thing in Mulan. Shrek had just came out. He had some really big su successes with Dr. Doolittle and, and the Nutty Professor. It seemed like a no-brainer. But you can tell this film was kind of written with Robin Williams in mind from what I'm looking at. Because this is incredibly miscast. And not to say Eddie Murphy's a bad actor. Apparently he has a third resurgence coming up with like some of his specials on Netflix. I don't know. 
Um, but this was just not his A game material. And I feel like, you know, they wanted to give this to Robin Williams, but Robin Williams had already left because of the Aladdin stuff. And so, like, all right, well, we have we have this guy. We have Eddie Murphy. He did great as Mushu, so let's put him in the role. And it was just it was a bad idea. Um, I also really feel like when Eddie Murphy didn't work into the 2000s, the Shaggy Dog remake was 2006. <laughs> so they kept trying to strike while the iron was hot. They're like, oh, my God, Aladdin did gangbusters. We need another comedian. Eddie Murphy. Uh, he worked for that. Uh, not for this. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. He's not a comedian. Uh, fine, just put him in a comedy. <laughs> so you could say his career died, came back to life, and died again several times. Yeah, we we see the ghosts of his past in this film, and and you can definitely tell. It's like watching this film. I didn't hate it. I understood it wasn't good. But, like, I didn't keep looking at my watch. I wasn't bored, but I wasn't entertained. And that's part of the problem is, like, it's very middle of the road for a film. And at its start, the part that really doesn't work is Eddie Murphy. And it's just, like, Eddie Murphy is... he He's a house salesman who's over... He's, he's working too hard... And he's married to another house salesman. So, like, you think that would work, but there's conflict. But, like, there's really not much to his character aside from a workaholic dad that you've seen in a lot of movies at this time. And I think Hook did a lot better, where Robin Williams actually made the type of role funny and something that you were compelled to see. Doug, what do you think? No, I agree. I think uh, the, the movie on its own is decent. So if you were to just take out everything with Eddie Murphy in it, you would actually have a somewhat decent film. Um, I feel also like the the female uh, lead, the uh, you know the wife, uh, she kind of gets really sidelined, and, and it's like they're supposed to be partners in real estate, but you never really get that impression it's just really you know eddie murphy just constantly on 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 and, and just you, you don't really get a, any impression that the two of them are actually a team of realtors so that that already falls flat well that's what happens yeah. when your character is a plot device mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big problem. It's like, I could give you a plot summary, but like this film doesn't really have a lot of plot, to be honest. And it's like, that's the big thing that's throwing me. It's like, a lot of this film is set up. We set up Eddie Murphy, an overworking real estate person, which, I mean, that's that's basically my dad in a nutshell. And I'm like, oh, I, I don't want to be reminded of that. And then you have Sarah Evers, who's his wife, who's supposed to be another house salesman, but you never see her close a house. And then you have these two kids, one whose whole character is he's afraid of spiders, and that's it. And the other child character is a girl who's 13 and somehow knows Latin. Like, that's really all they gave for the main cast. And it's like, there's not much to really expand upon with them. Um, but they get called out to sell a mansion. Because it has to be now, and, you know, we're going to go on a vacation, but we have to sell this house now. And it's just, like, I can see what they're going for with this. Like, again, I'm going to bring up Hook. Robin Williams, always on his phone, always doing the things. But he at least cares for his kids. Here, Eddie Murphy is just like, oh, no, we're on our way to the vacation, but I could come back early. No, I can't come back early. It's not funny. It's It's not endearing. It's just there you know what i'm saying pretty much it's every single 90s cliche family film ever like when you think about it because i remember so many just focusing so heavily on parents just working too much and it's like wow i wish i had that problem you know instead of worrying about whether i'd starve or you know be able to uh like find work or something and like th these are like 
privilege problems that they keep inserting into those movies in the 90s, saying like, oh, they should quit their job and spend more time with their boring ass kids. Like, really? Come on. And this trope lasted way longer than it should have. Like, I think this was, like, yeah. among the last of the movies to do this shit. And I'm glad it died off. Like, so glad. I mean, hell, Robin Williams was doing this type of thing well into the 90s with uh, Mrs. Doubtfire and stuff like that. But at least you had a had some a hook to make it entertaining. It's Robin Williams in drag. Like, you know, you have some sort of hook. Here is just... There's not really a hook. And so they have to sell this mansion. They go in and they're not even spooked by the fact that the gate is locked and yet it unlocks by itself. And there's a cemetery there and nothing is upkept and there's no staff. And I'm just like, how are you this dense? <laughs> because there are red flags everywhere. <laughs> I just don't understand how they think they can flip a place that has a personal cemetery. It's like, you either have to find someone with enough money to unearth all that shit legally and move it somewhere legally, or someone willing to actually take over the upkeep on it. And you saw the size of that cemetery. Like, that would cost a fortune like holy shit like i wouldn't be surprised if it was declared a shrine given how old some of those tombstones were just i don't understand from like a real estate perspective how that is considered a good sell in any possible way can you imagine trying to set up the electricity and whatnot in a place like that like holy shit you go bankrupt just trying to get the place on the market ugh and, like, the fact that it's all dusty, there's cobwebs everywhere, like, the grounds aren't kept at all. So, like, there's just red flags everywhere. But even then, even if you could flip this house, even if you could sell it, like, a lot of the cemetery would have to be, like, set or settled off. You couldn't take them out. But then you get poltergeists. Do you want poltergeists? <laughs> I don't know. That's a selling point for some people. <laughs> <laughs> you can open up a haunted bed and breakfast. It's just... I, so... <laughs> it's just, I love how unrealistic their responses are to these hauntings. Like, when they finally do start seeing the spooky shit, they don't act like normal human beings. Like, you know, the, these kids, they see this floating, glowing orb thing. Do they scream and run away? No, they just stand there and stare. They're like, what is it? I think we should follow it. I feel like it wants us to follow it. It's like, why are you not running from the glowing ball of possible death? <laughs> Be impressed, damn it. There are dead things here. Like, like, they don't react like anything. And I think the biggest problem is the main characters. The four main characters, they're so bland, they're not well acted. Eddie Murphy is trying his best, but he's trying too hard, and he's mugging every second. So you have three underacting characters, and one overacting character, that don't make it work. And the thing that I was constantly reminded of watching this film is like, man, this is a weird remake of The Haunting with Owen Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, because like that that movie had Owen Wilson as that type of character, and it wasn't like it was scary, but it had these moments where it took you out of it. And I'm just like, it's the same exact thing. These characters do not belong here. <laughs> and it's ironic considering Owen Wilson's in the new Haunted Mansion. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen, for the record, I haven't seen the new Haunted Mansion. Uh, we have seen Muppets Haunted Mansion, which might be next time. Since we did talk about it briefly in our top movies, but we didn't, like, go into it in depth. Um, but you can but always watch still, our uh, live react to it. <laughs> yeah, hint, hint, mm -hmm. wink, wink, mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Nudge, nudge. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, up until this point, it doesn't feel like a Haunted Mansion movie. Like, really, like, I've been to the Haunted Mansion ride in both California and Disney World. I personally like the one in Florida a little bit more. I think it has better presence and a better line. But overall, it's one of those like iconic rides. If you've been on it, you know. And it's like, the first bit of this movie is just like, where are the ghosts? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's going on? Um, 
I mean, to be it's fair, good. they do a somewhat decent job with the cinematography. At least it looks appropriately old and dusty and somewhat creepy. It's just they don't keep it up for the entire movie. They keep waffling between doing realistic special effects and then going full-blown CGI at a time where CGI really wasn't that good. Yeah, and it, it's a shame because, like, say what you will about a lot of the acting... When it comes to the uh, practical effect work, it is really good. But then you see CGI and it's so wonky. And it's like, it's not in a lot of the film, but it really is jarring. There's a couple of shots where I'm just like, oh my god, that's bad. And again, I was brought back to The Haunting because that had some, that had some uh, bad CGI there too. <laughs> Yeah, because it's like, because um, like you had some good stuff, like the ghost wafting in and out of existence, like that one was that was pretty cool. Um, you had uh, what was it? Madame Leota looked pretty decent. I mean, she wasn't just a stationary head; she actually looked like you know a real person's head in the ball. But then you had like real crappy CGI, like Eddie Murphy's face suddenly going all skeletal. Like you can tell how freaking fake it is and it or the the spinning the spinning cg <laughs> yeah that and they they keep waffling between how they want to portray the ghosts because sometimes they're solid and they just waft in and out of existence and other times they're like full-on like blue fuzzy shapes and it's like pick a tone like pick a look like are they do they look like ghosts or are they like solid people like it just doesn't or make sense. <laughs> And then, and then sometimes they're just people with no outline. Because when they go to sell the house, you have the the master of the house, and then you have the butler, basically both kneel the, before like, Zod, Ramsley, <laughs> General Zod, Butler Zod, um, who Terrence Stamp is probably the best part of this movie, um, and I, I second only to maybe Wallace Shawn. He's the inconceivable guy, right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So Wallace Shawn does great too but like when they first appear right they're solid human beings you see Terran stamp and he does nothing to stop being this creepy ass butler like he his tone like you can tell like something's up and then like you have this owner who's act who's eyeing this dude's wife really creepily the entire movie so like you have these subtle things but like there's nothing ghostly about them and then all of a sudden it just like oh no we're ghosts full time now <laughs> Not to mention the uh Terrence Stamp, the the butler. He has like no sense of like personal privacy or you know, personal space. He'll just walk into a room without knocking while, you know, God knows they could be uh naked in there or whatever, not presentable. He's and gotta be creepy. Yeah. He's just like, uh, it's, uh, I like how he just like appears behind them. It's just like, oh, I didn't see you there. Uh, yeah, did you? Did I mention I'm not a villain? <laughs> I, I'm really scary, right? Right? You were scared, right? <laughs> and yet at the same time, he just uh, he bit. makes his contempt for Eddie Murphy's character just so known. It's like, yes, we get it. He's an annoying character. Do you have to harp on about it? <laughs> and here's the thing. In in Shrek the Donkey, the entire role was supposed to be annoying. But here, we get that Eddie Murphy's annoying, but he's not supposed to be. Like I mean, everyone else seems to like him. I but. mean, it's supposed to be to a degree in that it's essential for his arc to be like, you know, the asshole workaholic dad and eventually become like the selfless loving dad by the end. But I don't know, it just there's no real transformation of his character at all throughout that. He's just Eddie Murphy the entire movie. Just maybe less of an asshole by the end of it. Like, really, you yeah, don't really see any point where he, like... I mean, maybe, like, toward the climax, but I don't know. You could argue that he was just scared into, you know, not going to hell into changing his ways or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's a lot because, like, I keep bringing this up, but Hook did this so much better. and. Hook has its own problems, but you have Robin Williams at the start, and you make the most likable person on Earth into this workaholic dad. It's brilliant. And then over the course of the film, you see him being a kid again and becoming the Robin Williams we all know. We see a very clear arc. With Eddie Murphy, I don't see it. The only thing is that he agrees to smash his car through 
the the glass and i'm like that's not an arc that's you just not caring about your car and why was your car even a thing in the first place well first off we had to do product placement you know because that's essential it pays (laughs) for the movie um, but also we had to ha- show that, you know, set up and pay off, you know, his his prized possession, which he values so much. So when he gets to the arc where he realizes he has to save his family at all costs, he sacrifices his great love, his car, in order to rescue them. Even though he's only shown to be, lo- be in love with it once, and that was it. And it was just an offhanded comment. It's not like it was his obsession or anything. Yeah, he should have been yeah, a car. He should have been a car salesman. That would have made a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, that would have made sense. Although I will say the one really like joke that I liked in the movie, and it's not a laugh out loud movie, and la- not even a laugh out loud joke. But I like when like he's just like hold on, and Madame Leota's like with what, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> um, but Madame Leota is just so wasted. Um, who who plays her? Jennifer is, is that the girl from? Terrence, is that the poltergeist girl? It's Jennifer Tilly. Jennifer Tilly, let me just... She's she's a famous comedic actress, like, and she's done a number of roles. Like, she's been in horror stuff, she's been in comedies, like, you know her in Family Guy as, uh... Wasn't she also also in in Liar, Liar? Liar. (laughs) She was in the Chucky sequel. Yeah, okay, so Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, she's, she's wasted in this film, because, like... The thing is, the effect work on Madame Leota is fine, but then they keep flip-flopping on whether or not they want the ghost to be scary. So they introduce her, and she starts making everything float around and making musical objects chase after him. And then she's just like, oh, I'm going to tell you cryptic clues. That's part of how it works. Like, the reason why she was talking like that on the ride was because she was awakening the spirits of the dead. (laughs) I think part of the problem, too, is they don't give a reason as to why she's there, why she has this prophecy. Like, what does she have to do with Mr. Gracie and the manor and what happened there and everything? Like, we don't even see her in flashbacks. Like, she's she's just there because her character was part of the ride. And yeah, ju- and just to spoil this a little bit, in the new version of Haunted Mansion, they actually explain why Madame Leota is there, why she is ahead in a crystal ball. Like it actually makes sense. Here we get none of that. She's just oh, she's a gypsy woman in a ball who made this prophecy in regards to why the mansion and everybody in it is the way they is. Cool. Like <laughs> all right. The, the, yeah, what, let's 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 be racist on top of that. Like it just because like Romani aside, Romani connections aside, like it just the the fact that they don't go into any detail. It's just like a thing for the ride. Like yeah, there's a lot of good references, but it doesn't make a good story. And at the same time, when they get to stuff like oh, we're gonna explain why everyone's dead, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, the, like, can we talk about the curse and how stupid it is and uh, how yeah. underexplained it is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, like, the whole big thing, the whole big reveal about the mansion is that there is a curse placed on it. A curse that happened after Mr. Gracie, you know, the headmaster, uh, lost his fiance, who he be- who he believed unalived herself. And in his grief, he unalived himself. That apparently caused, I don't know, a block in heaven or something, which means that both he and everybody else in the mansion from that point onward, whenever they passed, couldn't ascend to heaven. They were trapped on earth. And apparently the only way to break this curse, according to Madame Leota, was if his lost love came back to the mansion and I guess they got married, thus fulfilling his unfinished business or something. Like, it is extremely vague, like, why this happens, how this happens, you know, what is the solution to this? Especially when we find out later that, you know, his fiancée never really unalived herself to begin with, and that, you know, her murderer was in the place the whole time. So It was the butler. The butler did it. The butler always did it. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) But, like, so many um, things about this make no damn sense. It's like, 
they, we go through the graveyard at one point. We see all these ghosts that are trapped there hanging out, you know, with each other and stuff. Some of them are like from the medieval times. I'm like, wait, did they, was their ghost taken back from heaven and put back in the ground? Like, what about all these other people that died afterwards? Like, were they, you know, dragged back from their respective cemeteries into this one location because they happened to frequent it at one point? I just... <laughs> Yeah. They don't explain that's any another, of that. <laughs> that's a problem that I have with the movie. It's like, the thing about the ride is that they didn't feel a need to explain why their ghosts are there. There's 999 happy haunts. You could be a thousand. There's hitchhiking ghosts and whatnot. But they don't explain why they're there because the mystery makes it more enticing. And you can explain it but if you have to go so vague like this where nothing adds up it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me why they did it this way uh doug yeah i mean honestly like anything remote resembling the ride in this is like purely fan servicey and it's done in like the laziest way like the they come across like the singing statues and, you know, they're asking him questions and it feels like they should be, you know, actually telling them where to go, whatever. But instead, they just kind of randomly sing about whatever it was that was just said. Uh, and then they take them with them on the car ride. And I don't get it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, this is like it's a lot of the problem that I have with a lot of the movies based on the rides like Pirates of the Caribbean and Jungle Cruise. It's like they they don't really so much incorporate the elements of the ride. They just kind of do their own thing and kind of have the, you know, the ride aspects in the background so they don't get in the way. Yeah, it's it's weird because like at least with the Jungle Cruise, I enjoyed the movie. Like overall, I could sit through it and I enjoyed it, and I saw what they were trying to do with it. With here, I've been on the ride so many times, I know it to death. But when it's just like when Wallace Shawn turns, it's like there's always my way, and then they burst out with a carriage. I'm like, that's not <laughs> what happened in the ride. <laughs> I know that like honestly that moment summarizes like everything wrong with this movie you know Eddie Murphy aside it has no idea the tone it's supposed to be going for like Wallace Shawn should not be the one saying that line the whole purpose of that line is leading up to the ghost host explaining you know how he tried to escape the mansion which was basically unaliving himself because that was the only way he could escape it's a feeling of like He's trying to make it lighthearted in a way, but it's actually incredibly morbid. Whereas in this situation, we have a line that's supposed to be morbid, and yet it leads up to something funny. It's yeah, it's backwards. It's, <laughs> it's frustrating because I love Wallace Shawn. I love him in, in Princess Bride. I love him in Toy Story. But here, like, he's a great character, but he's tonally... Uh, against what the ride was going for because in the ride it's like of course there's always my way ha 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 lights go out and you see the pictures slowly coming down with them like their deaths showing up it's supposed to be a scary moment yeah like it just, God, <laughs> I, I just always think of that moment. And here's the weird thing, because of the way it's said, because of the way it's done and carried out, it took me a long time before I realized, wait, that's supposed to be the signature line from the ride. Oh my God, they ruined it. I am pissed. What the hell? Yeah. And I was like, I could be angry with this movie. It's very bland, though. Like I, I, The problem that I keep running into is the lack of substance. Because it's just like, the best part of this film for me is Terrence Stamp. He's zotting it up. He has this creepy butler voice and blah, blah, blah. And Mr. Gracie does a good job. So you have these two characters. And then you have the, the maid and Wallace Shawn. And they're entertaining. But overall, there's not enough substance to this movie. Aside from, we're cursed to die because the butler did it and why is it why does the butler always do it and then at the end he summons the demons from hell and they take him instead 
It's, oh my god, so that part. Uh, anticlimactic. <laughs> oh my god, I, I need to talk about this. Because, like, I do not understand, like, R- Ramsley's whole thi- thing, like, his plan. So, we find out that he actually poisoned um, Mr. Grace's fiance Elizabeth. We find out he's, the he's re- a racist. Yeah, he's, he's a, racist. a... They don't say it, but you know he's a racist. And, yeah, <laughs> so... Yeah, we know he's the reason why they are all cursed, why they are trapped there. Um, but then he learns that the only way to undo this curse is to bring her back, thus, you know, marrying the two, which would, I guess, free the household to move on. But this confuses me, because A, that would mean Terrence Stamp would have to be dragged back to hell, because dude committed murder, first degree murder there. So I don't understand why he is in a rush to leave this household. At least as a ghost, he's stuck in a constant plane where he's not being tortured consistently. So why would he want to make this happen so he could get dragged back down? He even says at one point, there are worse things than death, indicating he might have already gone to hell. And this is now like his only like safe haven. Like what did he expect to happen to go to heaven? Like, really? And, like, what was he going to do if Elizabeth actually did show up and is like, oh, yeah, that guy killed me? Like, did he expect to get away with it? Did he expect to get rewarded for it? And why would he summon the minions of hell if they were just going to drag him back to hell? I know! How? (laughs) Why would he? How does he? Since when does he have the power of hell? Was he the reason why they are all up there? Like, was he, like, dragging everybody else with him as, like, hostages? Like, none of this this makes sense. He is the awful bad guy. His motivations do not make the slightest bit of sense. Is he Black Arts Beagle? Is he the is he the the, the ghost butler from DuckTales? Tell us. <laughs> Duck? Duck said no parties. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's just <laughs> go. On. You know what the funny thing is? Like I don't know if you ever watched any of Eddie Murphy's stand up. But there's a pretty famous bit where he talks about why you would never see black people in a haunted house type movie because they're smart enough to know when to get the fuck out. Yes, exactly. (laughs) It's like, hell no, hell no. (laughs) I mean, Vega did a parody of that in Linkara's reviews. Like, oh, hell no, 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 hell no, no. I mean, there is that stereotype of them yelling at the, uh, the screen in the movie theaters. It's like, yeah. They'd be smart, smart enough to know not to get involved <laughs> with this or get out quick. My favorite TikToker, he, he there's a there he did a small skit of himself like looking around the house and like t- talking to this person. He's like, so why are they selling this place? And she's like, oh well, somebody died here. And then the next scene is him leaving in his car. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know that bit in um God, I it's the trailer for like a buddy cop movie. He's like, no, no, hell no. <laughs> Fuck this shit, I'm out. Fuck this shit, I'm out. That's basically the entire thing, because anyone who's a person of color that I know, they would immediately be like, nah, I've seen enough horror movies to know who gets killed first. (laughs) And and Sarah Evers just, like, is listening to this guy rambling about his dead wife for hours, hours, (laughs) and doesn't get creeped out. (laughs) Oh my god, that drove me up the freaking wall, is like... How long was he talking about his dead fiance, but like before he finally freaked her out enough to run? Like how long? Because we got to see she, like Sarah leave at the same time that Eddie Murphy and his kids leave, and during the time that she is listening to him going on about this whole spiel about you know his lost love. Eddie Murphy was able to find Madame Leota, find his kids, escape the house, go out to the cemetery, break into that crypt, get the key, use the key on the secret chest, find out the whole mystery about about the uh, about the murder, uh, get cast out by Ramsley, and then break his way back into the mansion before Sarah finally runs away from Mr. Crazy. <laughs> Like, yeah, that had to like, take place at least over several hours. <laughs> and, and part of this is why it feels like a remake of The Haunting, because a lot of the, the way the mansion looks, uh, the way it behaves, a lot of the plot beats 
feel like they really took it from the haunting and like yeah there are some different ones like the walls moving and whatnot but there was no through line of a mystery it was just a haunting and here it kind of feels like that too so they had to throw in a mystery and they they put up the runtime and they're like okay so madame leota tells them to go to a cemetery to find a key they don't react to zombies or dead people like any normal person would and they're able to get back and it's just like that subplot is superfluous it really is it just it's like he has to get over his fear of of spiders and and open a door and i'm like it, it was like dude your family's about to be eaten by zombies like you really can't force yourself to like go past the spiders like they're not gonna bite you instantly this isn't arachnophobia come on <laughs> And it's like, I'm afraid of spiders, too. I'm afraid of the dark. I have my own fears. I have PTSD from, like, loud noises and certain things from fire. But if there were zombies and I had to open the door, it's just you open the damn door. <laughs> I'm just thinking of all those horror movies where, like, a character gets a ahead of the other characters and in their panic locks the others in with the serial killer and they're just like too panicked to unlock the door it's like dude you are the worst person and i hope you die immediately <laughs> you uh, what what is it with the people in horror movies going back into the house with a killer you go outside even if the killer's outside at least you can go to another house <laughs> but uh doug what do you think wait sorry i i'm lost where what what are we talking about now uh, we're just talking about how there's not really a plot through line to this movie. No, no. I mean, there, there's the, the, the general plot of, you know, the, 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 the hus the fiancés. Um, but aside from that, yeah, it's like, they just kind of threw in these, you know, minor things just so the Betty Murphy can be father, etc. It's like, yeah, th there's not a whole lot going on. Also, quick question in terms of the fiance. So the other characters are all ghosts. It's, you know, they're de they're dead and everything. And she died too. But somehow she was trapped like the rest of them, but not really because she was reincarnated. So which is it? Is she trapped or is she reincarnated? Like... Did, like what did, uh, it's, it's like, whatever also, we need for the for the plot to happen yes also we have a threesome with eddie murphy and and <laughs> and mr gracie and the wife and it's weird dude she could do so much better <laughs> <laughs> you gotta admit that was uh, funny though i just like the kids looking at it like why is uh eddie murphy's wife kissing another man <laughs> Yeah, it's just so weird, and it just, it reminds me of, like, I don't know if you've seen, I think it's Notting Hill, where, where uh, Robert Downey Jr. goes back in time, and he does a butter ad, and it's the most sexual butter ad ever, and, like, that's what you, Mr. Gracie basically is. Wow, you just combined three very mismatching elements of, a, of the film I'm I know you're talking about. <laughs> I am I forget what film it is. It's, no, Kate and Leopold. It's Kate and Leopold. No, it's, it's Kate and Leopold. Kate and Leopold. Oh. It was Hugh Jackman. That was Hugh Jackman, so. yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's not Robert. Da what? <laughs> Robert Downey Jr. and Hugh Jackman have similar faces. Bullshit. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Blasphemy. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah. So it's it's like you you have Hugh Jackman doing this Central Butter commercial, and he's from like the 19th century, and that's what Mr. Gracie basically is. So you take Kate and Leopold, put it put it as like a plot point in this movie. Like this is is cribbing so many random things. I don't get it. it. It's not like infuriating, but I'm just like I'm I'm staring at my screen, being like, okay. And is this? A, am I supposed to be laughing? Because <laughs> you know, I can at least quote Mushu. Like <laughs> even some of his lines that aren't funny are quotable. Hell, Donkey, everything's quotable. So even if you don't find him funny, you can quote it. But here, I I I. I He's just like, oh man, like, look at this. He starts stealing stuff from the house. Like, why? No, the writing is terrible. Like, the dialogue is terrible. Like, th there's no doubt about that. Just, 
uh, I, I like flinch every time I hear like certain lines. Like you could tell Eddie Murphy kind of like went with his material. Like he had little of it. So he kind of just improvised as himself. So there's that. But then like the other lines just... Uh, like, like, when they first get there, everybody is playing the pronoun game. They're like, oh, we would love to have you overnight. Nothing creepy about that. Oh, we shouldn't tell these kids about this deep, dark secret. Oh, but they're involved. It's like, dude, come on, talk normal for crying out loud. The storm has flooded the river in five seconds. In five <laughs> seconds. Yeah. Like, legit, like, it's so weird. It's like, I can understand ghosts, but like... Oh, all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. The storm has flooded the river. I'm afraid you can't leave. Like, that's not creepy or anything. And it doesn't even follow continuity because they go outside later and it's completely dry. <laughs> it's like at least well, the, the see... new, uh, you know, the, the movie that came out this year. At least they, they managed to, you know, give them a reason to come back because it's like without giving too much away, basically the spirits follow them when they leave. So they kind of, it's like either you, you know, no matter what, you're in a haunted house. So we kind of have to go back there anyway. Maybe we so can actually like, deal with it. <laughs> yeah, like, I get what they're going for with this movie, but it has little stops and... and I hate to say it, but so far the best ride-based movie that they produced was the movie Tower of Terror that aired on the Disney Channel. It was a Disney Channel <laughs> original movie, and it was amazing. <laughs> I mean, I'll take your word for it. Like, strangely enough, that's like one of the few movies I haven't gotten around to, and it's not that I lack the interest. I do want to watch it eventually. It's just I don't know. It's Somebody who is terrified of roller coasters, especially drops, I never once set foot on the Tower of Terror. I worked outside it for certain, and I got to hear people scream all day long. But, yeah, I, I mean, I'll take your word on it, because, like, right now, the only magnum opus to me out of all of the existing uh, ride movies out there is Pirates of the Caribbean. The original, I should say. And that's part yeah, of- Yeah, the original. And that's yeah. part of the reason why I hated this movie so much after I saw it, because you watch Pirates, and then you watch this. It's like comparing gold to shit. Like, the, you really can't. And on top of that, it's a ride that's like one of my favorites. So it just made it all the more insulting. And like- even years later, I'm not, I don't hate this movie as much with a visceral, but I still hate it enough for not even trying. Or at least not yeah. making a decent enough effort. It does feel like they phoned it in a lot here. And like lately, Pirates has become a, a more of my favorite ride. I went on it when I, we went to California for the trip to Rosen's wedding. And we got stuck in front of Captain Jack Sparrow. The, the ride got stuck. It was amazing. I loved it. And he <laughs> was speaking to us. But, like, in addition to, like, just having the ride, like, you have the drop at the beginning. You have the smell. You have the atmosphere. I love the Haunted Mansion as a ride. But I feel like I've been in on it so many times that a lot of the magic is gone for me because I know it's going to happen. Um... They updated Pirates of the Caribbean, so it's like it was still a, it's still an immersive experience for me. But even still, they put so much effort in that movie. They put like so much money, so much time to make it accurate to the time period that they were trying to capture. It's not the exact same as the ride, but it has the spirit of the ride. Whereas ironically, this doesn't have like Haunted Mansion doesn't have the spirit of the ride, <laughs> pun intended, but it has. Just references as callbacks, and I think the biggest egregious moment for me, like, I didn't find a lot of it groan worthy, except for the, the singing heads. Because they like they have the fan service, Grim Grinning Ghost, so good. And then they start singing random songs, and I'm like, why? Ugh. And here's the like the ironic thing, too. Like, I don't know if you know much about the lore of like the haunted mansion and all that. But there's a different story, actually different stories, for each individual mansion in each Disney World. So there's, like, different ones for the one in California, for the one in Florida, for the one in Paris and Tokyo. They each have their own individual stories, and they have backgrounds explaining certain ghosts and why they're there. And the fact that the movie makers 
almost used none of it is just baffling. Like, the closest they managed to get was the the story behind the uh, Paris Haunted Mansion, which, you know, features a bride who sadly lost her love because of her overbearing father, who ends up becoming the, uh, the, the uh, demonic ghost that haunts the mansion. So... I don't understand why they couldn't go with that. Why they couldn't go with, uh, you know, the murderous bride, Constant Hatchway. They couldn't go with that. Like, you imagine how, what a great twist that would have been to show Elizabeth turning into her and then just going on a spree, like, chasing down the family. Like, I know that would have been an R rating right there, but seriously, that would have been hardcore. Like, there is so you, much. You they could have had done. a corpse bride scenario, you know? Like, it just, it's. It's frustrating because I love the Florida one. I've been to the California one and I've been to another park that was kind of like a similar ride with like a horse carriage, which like I feel like what they drew from that. But even still, like a lot of it just feels like it's not the ride. It's like the only surface level did it. And like, yeah, it's hard to make a ride experience into a movie. But if they can do it with Shrek 4D, you know, <laughs> they could do it here. God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just the my final point I want to make because I think we covered almost everything by this point my final point I want to make is that a lot of people don't seem to understand the appeal of the Haunted Mansion the overall atmosphere like they have 999 ghosts the reason is because the Haunted Mansion is a hop in place it is like the nightclub for like all the spirits out there those who are not ready to pass on who want to enjoy their afterlife to like their utmost freedoms like that's what like makes it so like you know so different from any other haunted house out there it's like you expect to go into a dilapidated house with all these horrible like t ghouls that are like eager to kill and to you maim and stuff but instead you go into this classy mansion where you have all these friendly ghosts that you know they love scaring but they do it in a fun playful way and they just want to do their own thing and you know maybe involve a person or two if they really want to like it's supposed to be a great hub and the movie just doesn't portray that. They just show these ghosts as, oh, they're trapped here until the curse is lifted. And then once the curse is, they all ascend to heaven and we never see them again. Okay, way to miss the entire friggin' point. <laughs> it, this is supposed to be a happy occasion. Let's mm. all bicker and argue about who killed who. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and, like, again, not to spoil too much, like, they thankfully kind of, re like, remember that in the newer version, but not enough. It's still this, you know, this mansion is haunted by these murderous ghosts, and we have to, we have to save them so those spirits can move on. It's like, no! Like, by all means, get rid of the uh, toxic spirits, because nobody wants to deal with that shit in the afterlife, but still... Well, let them be. Let them do their own thing. They don't need saving, per se. You know, they'll move on when they're, you know, good and ready. <laughs> yeah, just get rid of Jared Leto and you'll be fine. It, it's <laughs> like, uh, but but even still, I personally, I think the Muppets Haunted Mansion, and I, I, I haven't seen the new one, but I think Muppets Haunted Mansion is my favorite so far. Because it has oh, yeah. that tone still. Um, Before I do my final thoughts, Doug, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm I'm in complete agreement with this. It's like it is uh, very hard to do a movie based on a ride because I feel like they tend to write the movie first, and it's usually some sort of generic thing. And th it was this in Spades for Haunted Mansion No. Three, um, and then it's like anything really having to do with the ride is such an afterthought. Like, they've made the script and like, oh, yeah, we still have to put the, you know, elements of the ride into it to actually make it, you know, tie in. And it's like, yeah. Um, I will say at least with, like, the Muppets Haunted Mansion, yeah, th that was done with a lot of love to the source material because you, you had the combination of both the Muppets and you have them, you know, co basically cosplaying as characters from the the ride. You incorporate more elements of the ride. You have, you know, the bride is the uh, the big baddie in it. Uh, 
and it's just, it, it's done with a whole lot more love and makes you really feel more connected to the uh, the Haunted Mansion ride and the Muppets, of course. Uh, and then you have the movie that came out this year, which it's it sort of got that same problem of the 03 movie where, you know, really it's, it's more about the, you know, generic uh, haunted house movie that got, you know, the, the, the ride uh, thrown into, into the background. But they do a little bit of a better effort to, you know, incorporate those elements. And the fact that they've also got, you know, more going on with the, you know, main storyline and characters there that are actually interesting does make up for that. Um, whereas this is just like, there's so little effort. It's just a vehicle for Eddie Murphy to be in it. And I, I, I just, honestly, I forgot so much of the movie at this point. And, and I don't even know if there's that much to forget. <laughs> yeah. It's part of the problem that I had starting this is like, yeah, I have so many problems, but there's not much to say about the movie so much as what it doesn't do with the ride. And, and how much better Muppets Haunted Mansion is. Like, Muppets Haunted Mansion takes these characters and makes you feel for the Muppets and makes you cry. But it tells a great story, but it still keeps the spirit in the heart of the swinging mansion that has just a bunch of ghosts. And uh, and then you have Pepe there with Gonzo, and it, it, they make a great team. <laughs> um, This one is just so forgettable. It's It's not bad. It's bland. But it's not boring. It's just there. It's like it's I can't muster up hate for it personally because I just had so little to think about while watching this film. But I can't say it was good. Um, It's just it's there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, th- that's weird because it was ha- really hated at the time. But in recent years, you know, with Disney re-airing it as part of its Halloween roster, you know, more younger generations have grown to like it just because of, you know, like the effort that was put into it shining through a bit more and them having no real attachment to the ride that it's based on. But even so, I mean, like I said, I I don't hate it as much as when I first saw it, but it's still, it's still a movie I loathe, like, to a lesser degree. I just... It just baffles me. Like, you had the resources. You had the talents. Like, at one point, they were going to get Guillermo del Toro to do this movie. And he was set to do a remake of it. But it never went through because they don't know what to freaking do with this property that is basically gift wrapping them all these stories they could be telling. And it's all because they don't want to go too hardcore because it messes with their brand. And it's just, it's <sighs> frustrating. It's like, you know, Walt Disney came up with this because he wanted to go a little darker. He thought kids could handle it a little darker. I mean, this is the same guy that gave us Pinocchio, for crying out loud. Like, this should and could work if people would act stop being all uppity about it and trying to make it so PG. Yeah, and I would have loved to see Guillermo del Toro's Haunted Mansion or his Mountains of Madness or, like, anything by him. I still haven't seen his Pinocchio, because Guillermo del Toro does a great job. Mm-hmm. Um, and if t- if you're listening to this, Tifa, we know you love Guillermo. <laughs> this is for you. Um, well, he we, did, we love he Guillermo did do, del Toro, too. He did do his own version of Haunted Mansion called Crimson Peak. So there's that at the very least. But I still would have liked to have seen him do the legit thing, especially since he himself is a proclaimed fan of it. Yeah, so it's just it just kind of sucks. There's been a lot of like weird things there, but uh this movie's just kind of there. It's there for me like I could go on the ride, I can still enjoy it. I don't really want to see this movie again, but I don't want to like I'm not angry about it. Um any any other things to say before we sign off? Um like in terms of recommendation, I'd say see it if only to compare it to the newer version as well as Muppets Haunted Mansion and 
you know, just do it a fun comparison of like what they do right, what they do wrong. Because I mean, I still want to promote the hell out of the ride because it's one of D- Disney World's best attractions. It deserves, a, you know, it's it deserves its chance to shine, even if its source material is questionable at times. So mm. if you can get past Eddie Murphy's shit eating grin for like half the movie, by all means, you know, watch it. Yeah, and I mean, I I do like the one in California. Uh, I I like I said, I went to a wedding. It was a Disney wedding in California. It was a great time. I had to save up for a year and a half, but we went. Space Mountain is still amazing. Pirates is still my favorite ride. Um, they they did a great job with a lot of these things. Um, and the Incredicoaster was a lot of fun. But like when it comes to the Haunted Mansion in terms of property, you can do much better. Uh, anything else, Doug? No, I, I'd say pretty much what you said. Um, this movie is probably best viewed either high or if you're having like a Halloween party and you want to mingle, but you want to have something like on the background, you know, just to passively watch while you talk with people. It's probably best to do it then. I would not really recommend just sitting down watching it. And if you do... It's really a one-time watch. You don't want to watch All it All the boos. All the boos. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, if I was drunk, I'd have a more fun time. I just, I didn't feel as visceral disgust as with, like, the Cinderella live-action remake or the Dumbo live-action remake. Ah, uh, it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not that bad. So, like, with that being said, I'm Zenith Warrior Princess, the cutest of ghost buns. Ghost, 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 ghost. And I'm Kat McBerry, your ghost host. <laughs> and I'm Doug McBerry, and are the walls getting taller? <laughs> or is no, that that's your imagination? You. <laughs> you're getting taller, Doug. <laughs> and, and you're one- growing hair again. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> and one last thing, if I will, if I may. If you would like to join our jamboree, there's a simple rule that's compulsory. Mortals pay a token fee. Rest in peace, the haunting's free. So hurry back, we would like your company. Hurry back, hurry back. Be sure to bring your death certificate. (laughs) And just remember, it's on Disney Plus. You don't have to pay for it. I'm glad I didn't have to pay for this one. Thank God. (laughs) Have a good one, everyone. Yay.